morning. My name is uh, Len. Everyone's well today. Our first reading can be found on page 266 of the Church Bibles. That's page 266, and that's 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 17 to 24. That's 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 17 to 24, page 266. <coughs> Some time later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, What do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where she was laying, and laid him on the bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, have you brought tragedy even on this widow I am staying with? by causing her son to die. Then he stretched himself out over the boy three times and cried out to the Lord. Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry and the boy's life returned to him, and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, look, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. Our next reading can be found on page 778, and that is Luke chapter 7, verses 11 to 17. That's page 778, Luke chapter 7, verses 11 to 17. Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town called Nyan, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he appeared, as he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart, his heart went out to her, and he said, Don't cry. Then he went up and touched the bier they were carrying him on. And the bearer stood up and said, he said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. The news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. This is the word of the Lord. Len, I don't have anywhere to stick this. Um, can I add my welcome uh, to Phil's? If it's your first time here, my name's Andy. I'm the minister here at CCB, and it's great to have you with us. Um, last week we began a new series in Luke's Gospel called Saviour, and we're thinking about how Jesus Christ is our Saviour. And uh, I hope uh, you have your Bible open uh, in uh, Luke chapter 7 there, it's page 778. There's also a little handout that some people find it helpful to make doodles or, or jot along uh, of things like that. Uh, so do, please do do that. And we're also trying a new crash system today. If you see random numbers being scrawled onto the screen really badly, um, well, uh, th th we're trying a new system and you may see parents are sort of rushing in and out. Am I on? Hey, I was on mute. <laughs> mm. Every week I do something wrong on the tech. This is stuff we did. Yeah. So it's it's apparently I'm the dead guy, not the mute guy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Wrong week, wrong week. <laughs> Mark, you should be preaching. You're better, guys. <laughs> um, so, yeah, please do keep the Bible open uh, to this page. Um, it's a great passage, and, and, and my hope is that we're going to see our Saviour more clearly. And to that end, why don't I pray? Our Father God, whether we've been Christian for years, whether we're still investigating Jesus' claims, I, I pray that each of us here this morning would have a living encounter with him. Would, he, would we not just see that he is a saviour? Would we not just see that he is the saviour? Help us see that he is our saviour. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I don't know how many of you um, recognise uh, this painting. This painting. <laughs> 
There we go. Um, it's called uh, The Ambassadors. Uh, it was painted by Hans Holbein the Younger, 1533, according to Wikipedia. And uh, it, it features prominently two men, two young men. I don't know how you'd age them. I reckon they're probably late 20s, early 30s. They're at the height of their power, height of their virility. Uh, it's probably what the, uh, the dagger here represents. But they're not just young men. They're, they're rich young men. Notice that they're dressed in, in black. This is a very expensive dye in, in that, at that time. And obviously, having a, a painting commissioned, you've got to have some money about you. These were wealthy young men. But not only that, they were educated young men. See all these sort of scientific instruments around here? This is like the, the cutting edge instruments of their day. There's a math book there as well. It's like the modern, the ancient equivalent of a, of a, of a MacBook Pro. They're showing off their tech in this painting. But they're not just techie nerds, no. They're also really cultured. Look here, yeah, they've got musical instruments and they've got a hymn book and uh, they want to show they're cultured young men. But also they're very well travelled. Did you see the, the globe up uh, globe here and uh, it's this sort of Persian carpet and he's got his gap year beads. <laughs> he's been around. These guys have a lot going for them. They're young, they're wealthy, they're rich, they, they're, they're educated, they're cultured, they're travelled, they've got a lot going for them. Now, if you've seen this before, you may, you may uh, see what I'm about to say, but if you've never seen this painting before, you may have noticed there's a, there's a dirty great shadow hanging over this painting, uh, right down at the bottom here. It's not quite clear what it is, but if you're looking at the painting from, 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 from the side, which is the way it was intended, as you walk into the room, uh, you see this. Next slide. Whacking great skull. And art historians call this a memento mori. In other words, it's a not so subtle way of saying, remember, you're going to die. You might be rich, you might be young, you might be wealthy, you might be cultured, you might be educated. But this dirty great shadow, it, it hangs over every single one of us. Thank you, Sean. Now, I don't know if um, you've ever done any research into this, or any much thinking about this, but the statistics are pretty clear on this matter. One in one people die. We might, we might think we see it coming. A bit like this uh, past year and a half uh, with, with the COVID, pe uh, COVID pandemic. It's been a cause of anxiety for many of us because we, we see death coming slowly, inexorably towards us. Sometimes it might slowly creep up on us. Sometimes death does that. Um, I, I did some math this past week. I realized that if I live to the average age of a British man, I'm pretty much halfway through my life which is terrifying, so I wasted the first quarter playing video games. <laughs> it's slowly creeping. Halfway through, how did that happen? Sometimes death comes out of nowhere and takes us by surprise. Just a few months ago, uh, a, a neighbor of mine, two doors down, a dad of two children, died suddenly of a heart, heart embolism. No warning complete surprise to everyone. He was fit, he was young, he was wealthy, he was educated, he was cultured, and death claimed him. And I appreciate that for, for some of us here, I think particularly many of us who are young, this might really not like seem like a live issue. It might be something we can sort of put in the, in the memory bank and sort of file for, for later. Something we can think about on another date. I, I know for a number of us here, though, death is very much close to mind. It might be we are mourning the, the loss of a, of, a, of a friend or a grandparent. Thank you, James, uh, today. It might be you're mourning the loss of a child, <coughs> a miscarriage, or, or maybe mourning children you never had. Wish you could. Maybe you're, you're watching your parents slowly decline, maybe rapidly decline. 
we're here today, I think maybe if you're looking in on Christian things, I'm aware this might sound really morbid, maybe if this is your first impression of church and the guy stands up and starts talking about death, and, and I'm aware this is very un-British, isn't it, uh, to, to do this sort of thing. But each of us here today, we need a philosophy of life which makes sense of the fact that we will one day die. It's going to happen. At one point in my life, at some point in your life, my heartbeat, your heartbeat, is going to stop beating. Your lungs are going to stop breathing in and out. And you're going to die. We need to face up to that reality and have a philosophy of life which makes sense of that. Not, not just for those who are, who are grieving around us, but for ourselves too. And that is where this passage today is really going to help us. So I hope you've got this passage open before us. We're going to see that Jesus is able to help us. That he is our saviour. So the first thing I want us to consider is the unstoppable tragedy of death. That's our first heading. The unstoppable tragedy of death. Would you look with me at verse 11 of, uh, of chapter 7. Look down. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, or Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with them. Now Luke, really clearly, he wants to, us to understand this little passage in the light of what we saw last week in Capernaum. If you were here last week, you, you remember Jesus managed to miraculously, astoundingly, um, heal a centurion servant. And, and all the crowds that were with Jesus in Capernaum they're absolutely dumbstruck. They're amazed. So much so that, that they begin following Jesus along the road. They were in Capernaum, and now they're on their way to Nain, which is about a day's walk away. I think we've got a map which might say, uh, sort of show something of, of the distance um, up there. Here we go. So there's Capernaum. There's Nain. It's about a, about a distance away, a, a day's walk. And all the crowds, you can imagine that their sense of excitement as they begin to realize who this man is. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. He's doing something extraordinary amongst us. He's talking about the kingdom of God. And so you can imagine this, this forward momentum of excitement as this huge crowd gathers around Jesus and begins following him along the way. No doubt they're wondering, is this the man we've been hoping for? Is this the long-promised Messiah? Can I really be a part of his kingdom? But then in verse 12, this huge crowd, filled with that momentum, if you can imagine it, of joy and excitement, it comes crashing into another large crowd, full of mourning and crushed hopes. <coughs> verse 12. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a large crowd from the town was with her. Now you need to kind of get it right in your head. First century Jewish funerals are pretty different to your sort of modern day British uh, funerals. Our funerals are often, not always, but often very intimate family affairs, aren't they? Well theirs would have involved literally the whole of the town. Our funerals often have a, have a closed casket with the deceased out of sight. Uh, theirs, they, they would have had the, the body wrapped in, in cloth, wrapped in linen, and, and laid on a bier, a plank, and carried out. Our funerals are, are often marked, particularly in Britain, by, by somber silence. Theirs would have been loud, with every man and woman wailing, and shrieking. If you ever seen a Middle Eastern morning on, on the news, the, 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 the sort of the, the shrill shrieking of the of the men and, and the women, their grief would have been audible from miles away. So again, picture it. Here we have these two crowds, and they're, they're sort of converging in, in the same place. And, and at the as the crowd of, of the funeral comes out of the town, they're at they're at the gates. 
Jews, of course, believed that dead bodies were ritually unclean and, and in a hot country. They had to bury them as, as soon as possible. And so um, out the body went, out of the city gates, out of the clean place, and into the realm of the unclean, where they would be buried, unless they contaminate the, the people. And we're told in this instance of verse 12, this funeral is, is for a, a young man. Now death is always a tragedy, isn't it? But especially so when it's a, a child which dies. I think we here at CCB, if you've been here for a while, we know something of, of, of this tragedy. Um, around about three and a half, four years ago, um, we had a young girl in our congregation called Keziah, uh, the daughter of uh, Ross and Tansy, um, who died very suddenly of sepsis. I think she was 18 uh, months old. Fine in the morning, and by the evening, gone. Ross and Tansy's grief <laughs> is and, and was unimaginable. Maybe noticed it's strange here at verse 12. Luke focuses not so much on the plight of the son who died, but the mother. It's strange, isn't it? He's, he's sort of throughout the account, he zeroes on, 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 the, on the parent. She's the one who gave birth to him, fed him, uh, cuddled him, uh, disciplined him when he was naughty, took him to school, took him to synagogue, and now in a cruel reversal of the natural order, now she has to bury him. And to make matters worse, we're told she's a widow, which means compounded to her grief, she has the extra burden of having to continue providing for herself and, and protecting herself, because there's no men in her family to, to do that. And in the face of this sort of tragedy, death of a child what, what can we say what can we possibly say and it's kind of universally acknowledged isn't it the British culture we're rubbish at this sort of thing we're really really bad at it um, a couple of years ago there's a, a Guardian uh, columnist you might know him called Owen Jones he lost his father to prostate cancer and he wrote in the newspaper shortly afterwards, reflecting on our society's view of death. And, and this is what, he's, what he wrote, uh, the quote's up on the screen. He said, grief gnaws at all of us, but often we don't have the emotional tools to deal with it. Our culture poorly equips us to deal with grief. A combination of death being treated as a macabre, taboo subject, and a particularly English awkwardness of raw emotions. But it's also, and let's be honest about this, that the expression of emotion is portrayed as weakness in our society. I think all of us perhaps feel something of, of, of what he says there. Just not knowing what to say or what to do when someone around us suffers a loss. It can be tempting, can't it, to just repeat this sort of the empty sentimental platitudes of the Clintons car. It can be tempting to keep away from those who are suffering because we might put our foot in it. We might say something insensitive and cause things to be worse. It's been noted for many people who suffer loss that they go through something what's called a second bereavement. I don't know if you've heard of that, a second bereavement. First it's the, the loss of the actual loved one, but then it's the loss of support from those around them. Because months after the funeral, people just simply don't know what to say or what to do. They've moved on, but clearly the parents haven't. And so they think the best thing to do is simply to skirt around the edges and not to mention the obvious ongoing grief in their life. And so those who are suffering are now suffering completely alone. Our culture is terrible, terrible at grief. In Luke 12, if you look down, Luke verse 12 here, uh, Luke wants us to see that this widow is, is not completely alone in her grief. No, notice the whole of the town are with her. 
See, their, in their culture, very different to ours, in their culture, grief was very much a big corporate thing, not a private, personal thing. Emotions were, and grief was to be shared and not to be kept bottled up within. And I believe from our memory, from my memory, that's what we tried to do with Ross and Tansy when Kazai died. We, we gathered around them. We, we, we tried to meet their uh, material needs so they didn't have to work. We, 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 we try and still talk about Kazai and Kezi, which you, she's known. We still talk about her, not in the past tense, but as she is with her Lord. That's what Ross and Tansy want. But it's not just, um, it's not just the town who grieve with the mother in this account. I don't think it's accidental that in verse 12, Luke chooses to describe the boy as the only son of his mother. Elsewhere, you might know Jesus, that's the way he describes his relationship to God. He describes himself as the only son of the father. I think, I think the reason Luke uses this deliberate language is he, he's trying to hint ahead of what happens at the very end of his account. When, of course, the only son of the father died. So what this means is, friends, we, we have a God who, who knows something of loss. We have a God who can empathize with us, therefore, in our losses, in our grief. We have a God who's full of compassion. So back to the scene there. We've got this advancing, jubilant crowd arriving at the gates of Nain. And then coming out of the city, we've got this crowd with the exact opposite emotional stance. And they're coming, colliding together. What does Jesus do? Does, does, he, does he change direction in embarrassment? Does he, does he pass by in, in awkward silence? Let's leave them to it. Let's carry on our joyful thing over here. Does he offer vague, sentimental platitudes? None of the above. Look what he does in verse 13. Are you there, verse 13? When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her. And he said, don't cry. And for me, I think this is perhaps among one of the most difficult sayings of Jesus. How can Jesus' heart go out to this widow and then him follow that up by something which, some words which appear so cruel, so callous? I was chatting with Ross this week and he said that if, uh, if someone had said to Tansy at Kezi's funeral, don't cry, you know, at best they would have been discreetly ushered out. At worst, they would have got a punch in the face, and rightly so. How can you say that to a grieving mother? Don't cry. I don't think Luke's aim here is to give us a how-to guide of pastoral care, how to speak to someone who's grieving. I don't think that's Luke's aim here. Jesus is absolutely unique as a person. He's absolutely, absolutely unique in what he can do. And I think he's intending here to give us a window into what, what his kingdom will be like when it comes. He wants the crowds, both the, the jubilant crowd and, and the mournful crowd, he wants both of them to see what his kingdom will be like when it comes in, in all of its glory. And so if you might remember that, that sermon back in chapter 6 when Jesus says, Blessed are you who weep now, the same word as the widow. Blessed, blessed are you who weep now. Why? For then you will laugh when the kingdom comes. So here's the widow's crowd. They're coming out of the gates, carrying, carrying the son's body. And they come, here's Jesus' jubilant crowd coming into the town. One crowd, if you like, is the procession of death. The other, a procession of life. And, and so we want to know, don't we, what happens when the, when the unstoppable force, what happens when it meets the immovable object? And we're told. Look at verse 14. Then Jesus went up and touched the bier that they were carrying him on. And the bearers 
stood still. Jesus is able to stop the unstoppable tragedy of death because he is the immovable Lord of life. The, the fact that Jesus touches the frame that the body was on is simply, simply remarkable. As I mentioned earlier, dead bodies were considered to be sort of ritually unclean. So, for, so any Jewish rabbi wouldn't go anywhere near a, a dead body, even, even at a funeral. But Jesus, what does he do? He, he reaches out and he touches death. He walks forward and, and stops the procession of death in, in full march. And in so doing, he risks himself being considered unclean. But, but that's not what happens here. No. Death doesn't contaminate Jesus. Rather, Jesus breaks death. The end of verse 14 goes on. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. And the dead man sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. One moment the boy is dead. There's no heartbeat. There's no pulse. There's no brain activity. He's bound tight in these wrapped up bits of linen, lying on a plank. And then what does Jesus do? He simply says a word. There's no CPR to get the... Uh, the heart moving, there's no defibrillator shock. Simply a word. Simply a word. And he says, be raised. And we're told the dead man sits up. What a brilliant sentence. The dead man sits up. Now obviously, this is impossible, right? It's um, miraculous, to say the least. It's impossible. And, and you should know, this sort of thing doesn't happen often. You can probably count on one hand how many times in the entire Bible a dead person comes back to life again. Even Jesus' ministry, is, it doesn't happen often. This is rare. This is impossible. So here is Jesus. He's the Lord of life. And he, he's giving us a picture of what will happen when his kingdom fully comes. This is a foretaste of what will happen at the very end of time. When at the sound of his voice, the dead will be raised to new life in him. Now, as I've been preparing this passage this week, the thing which is thing which has really jumped out at me is the attention which again Jesus gives to the mother. The focus in this passage isn't the, the dead boy, it's not. The focus is the mother. After raising the boy to life, Jesus gave him back to his mother. Which is really strange, isn't it? Because you might think, well, surely the boy is already his mother's. Seems like a bit of an unnecessary thing to say. And there's different reasons for this. So one thing, it might be alluding to that our first reading, 1 Kings 17, where the prophet Elijah, after praying to God, praying to the Lord, raises the boy back to life and then goes downstairs and gives him back to his mother. It may be simply an allusion to that passage saying, Jesus is a greater prophet, he's even greater than Elijah. He, Jesus, is the Lord himself. It might be that, but I think it's much more. Death, if you think about it, what does it do? It severs relationships. It cuts them in half. Anyone who's, who's lost anyone here knows that. If you've lost a, a grandparent or a parent or a friend or a child, that relationship which you had is, is cut. And people might give you sentimentalities and say, oh, I'm sure they're very close to you still. That's not true, is it? The reason death is horrible because it cuts those relationships in half. Someone we used to love, someone we used to talk to, someone we used to embrace, we can't do that anymore. Death severs relationships. It ruins them. Which is why the very first thing Jesus does after raising this boy back to life is to give him back to his mother. The first face this boy sees is Jesus's. And then Jesus hands him back to his mum. And 
on that last day when Jesus raises all of those who are his. When Jesus raises little Kezi, the first face she's going to see is Jesus's. And then Jesus is going to hand her back to Ross and Tansy. Here you are. She's not yours. And every, every tear, every tear will be wiped away. And that word which Jesus preached in the previous chapter will come true. Blessed are you who weep now, for then you will laugh. Can you imagine the laughter on that day? As we were reunited with those brothers and sisters, those mums and those dads, those grandparents, those children who know Jesus and we're back with them. Can you imagine that day? What laughter. So they, they, back again to the passage. Those two crowds, completely different postures, completely different purposes. Now they're completely united in their, their complete praise of Jesus. Did you see that, verse 16? They were all filled with awe and praise God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding countryside. Now, it might be you're here today and you're still looking at all Christian things. You've got big questions. And you might be thinking, oh, well, this, this sounds lovely. This is, this is such a lovely thing for you Christians to have. But surely this is just nonsense. Surely when we die, we die and that's it. We go into the ground, we come dust and that's the end of us. Surely the best thing we can do in life is simply propagate our DNA, try and have some lasting legacy in our, in our, mean, uh, in our genes or our means, whatever it might be. Let's try and pass something on before we go. But really there's nothing we can say in the face of death. Maybe that's... If you're honest, that, that's kind of what, what you think. You might say, well, this sounds lovely, but surely it's a fairy tale. Where's the evidence, Andy? Which is rightly, because it's written this very account for us. The first four verses of this account, if you want to go back and read them, kind of says, I'm writing this so you might know the certainty of these things which have been fulfilled among you. Luke and the other gospel writers, again and again, they want to impress upon us. These things really happened. But we, have a, we have a place, name, we have dates. People could have gone and walked to this uh, village and asked, did this boy really come back to life? Very easily they could have disproved that story, couldn't they? Luke's writing this historical account so that we can know these things to be true. And throughout these miracles, Jesus again and again reveals his identity. He's not just a prophet like Elijah, which is the, the crowd's first guess here. He's not just the Messiah, the Christ. He is the Lord. He is the Son of God. And he's come to save his people. And I think as you look at this passage carefully, I think it, it foreshadows exactly how Jesus would go on and do that at the end of his accounts. What did Jesus do? Rather than shying away from death, Jesus intentionally walked towards it. He knew he would die in Jerusalem. He knew the people there wanted him dead, but he went there anyway. And he went there for you, and he went there for me. He died in order that we might live. He was made unclean in order that we might be washed clean of all of our sin. He was buried outside the city gates in order that we might enter into God's holy city, that new Jerusalem, the future Jerusalem to come. But of course, that wasn't the end of the story, was it? It didn't end with Jesus' death, because death couldn't hold him couldn't contaminate Jesus, rather Jesus broke death. He was raised by the power of the Spirit. Over 500 people saw him, talked with him, walked with him, ate with him, and then exploded around the world telling everyone about him. The end of this passage foreshadows that. Having seen this resurrection, everyone goes around spreading the word, and that's exactly what happens at the end of Luke's account. And in the sequel, Acts, people went around saying, Jesus has broken death. He's beaten death. So 
again, if you have a philosophy of life which says this life is all there is, eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow we're going to die, well, I'm afraid there's really nothing you can say to someone who's grieving. There's really nothing you can say of no words of comfort really you can bring. There's really nothing you can say about your own death, really, either. Like those young men we saw at the beginning, those two ambassadors, where are they now? We don't even know their names. We're not completely sure of them. Will your great-grandchildren know your name? Will they appreciate all your cultural endeavours? Probably not. One day we're going to die. But if Christ was raised, then there is something we can say. And of course, we've got to be very careful on how we say it and when we say it. But can I, can I encourage you not to be British and not to shy away from speaking about death and not shy away from speaking hope to people who are grieving? This is something Ross and Tandy have been very helpful on. They've been really helped by people who talk to them about the resurrection, who remind them of the reason of the hope that they have, Kezi. Don't be British. Talk about Christ. How can we keep this news to ourselves? Because we have what no one else has. We have hope. I'll close with this, this story. I read it in the, in the newspaper not long ago. Um, it's just before the pandemic sort of hit. It's back in sort of March 2020. And there was a, a young boy in Monmouth called Samuel Barker. Uh, he was six years old and has been dropped off at home and he got hit by the bus, the school bus, which, which was dropping him off, and it, he died instantly. His mother was there to pick him up, and she saw the whole thing happen. It's an absolute tragedy. But their family were Christians. They, they raised Samuel to know Jesus. They prayed with him every day. They wanted him to know the reason for the hope that they had, even in the face of death. Um, her mum, uh, the mum cat, she said this in a, in a local paper. She said, I was there in seconds. I picked him up off the road and put him on my lap. I knew he was dead straight away and there was no suffering. I praise God for his life and I know exactly where he is now. And I, I thank God that it was so quick. I kissed his head, his very tousled hair. And she also shared with the newspaper something her own son had written just a, a few months before the accident. I think we've got this up on the screen. His, as you expect, his handwriting and his grammar wasn't brilliant. So let me read it to you. He said this, Samuel Barker, age six. I love Jesus and God because they look after me and are nice to me. They love me very much and they make me better. And they're the best adults in the whole wide world. And I love them very, very much. They're so very nice to me so I will always believe in them. They like me so much. They're so, 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 so kind to me and I trust them. They give me strength. He loves me all the time, I praise the Lord. I can trust in them. They're the best. I'm excited to go to heaven. I, never, I will never hurt myself, I will never get a stitch. And he died on the cross for me. He saved my life. Cat, Cat's, uh, she goes on, she, she shared in the papers how, how the impact of this boy's testimony was simply extraordinary. I, I go on, this is what she said in the newspaper. God has been so good to me. He's been on me. There's been something stirring inside of me. God is so good. The day after Samuel died, my niece gave, gave us the greatest gift as she gave her life to Jesus. My real hope is that people see that Jesus can't be cotton wool and feathers. Jesus can't be cotton wool and feathers. He is substantial. He is sustaining. He must be. Because I'm not strong. I'm seeing people having their worldview smashed by this. Other Christians are being bold because of what's happening. It's so, so wonderful. People are speaking the name of Jesus and it's so precious to hear of others shining for Christ because of this. I like to imagine I'll be that brave, and I like to imagine I'll say something similarly amazing should one of my children die. I don't expect to be anything like that eloquent. But 
friends, in Christ we have hope. Because he is raised from the dead. If you're not yet trusting in Christ, what can you say to death? Who is your saviour? Maybe today is a good day to make him your saviour. To acknowledge your weakness, your powerlessness in the face of death. And recognise he is your only saviour. I'm going to pray now to that effect. Uh, so you might want to make my prayer your prayer. But let's, let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we recognise around us the, the unstoppable tragedy of death. We recognise our own weakness, our own inability to do anything about it. Lord, as I contemplate my own death, thank you for giving me a saviour. Thank you that Jesus stopped death in its tracks. Thank you that he did that by himself, dying in my place, becoming unclean for me being buried outside the city gates for me and then being raised to life for me. Help me to be transformed by Jesus' resurrection and to go and spread the good news to all who are here. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Like the band up to the front. We're going to close our service by singing two songs.